Okay, we're going to discuss Islam's major beliefs, going to give an overview of uh, the early history and the beliefs that come out of this monotheistic faith. Some questions to consider and be able to discuss when you show up in class or what are some similarities to other religions that you see and what issues must this faith deal with after the death of Muhammad. It's going to have a profound impact on the development and ultimately the split in the Islamic world. So let's see what happens. Your basic tenets that we talked about last time are contained within the five pillars of faith. These were received um, by the Prophet Muhammad on his night journey to Jerusalem directly from God. Profession of faith, the Shahada. Uh, basically that you are not keeping this faith a secret, that you are, if you are asked, that yes, I am a believer. Salat, or prayer, um, you are to face five or face the holy city of Mecca and site of pilgrimage and do it five times a day. You also have what is simply known as giving alms, zakat or charity. It's typically at least 2.5 percent of your wealth that is expected in some sort of charitable work to help others in need. Fasting uh, during Ramadan, which is based on the lunar calendar when it actually occurs, so it's a little bit different each year. Uh, you are not to eat or drink or drink very little, just water basically to sustain yourself during the daylight hours uh, during the month of Ramadan. This is to signify and to mirror the conditions that Muhammad went through when he was in the cave in the desert outside of the city of Mecca and he first began hearing the um, word of God uh, which ultimately became the Quran, uh, the holy text from the angel Gabriel. Last but certainly not least, each follower of the faith is supposed to make at least once in their lifetime a pilgrimage to Mecca and some other locations, in Medina as well, uh, but most importantly to the Kaaba, this large structure that you see here pictured on the right. Um, if you are physically and financially able to do so, you are to go. Um, it's that ideal of equality and unity amongst believers. This had been a holy site of pilgrimage since um, believed to have been built during the time of Ab Abraham. And you're supposed to go. We talked before about that universal appeal, that system of equality that um, Islam professed. Uh, so let's talk about women in Islam. Now, pre-Islam, there are no rights in the Arabian Peninsula for women. Uh, remember, they said this is you know tribal law, old traditions. Islam has no rights. Um, now, in Islam, you are going to see some rights that develop early on. Um, there are going to be restrictions on how many wives a man can take. It's maximum of four wives, which, you know, doesn't seem like it's anything in today's world, but at the time it was important. Uh, women can divorce, they can leave abusive husbands, they can, you know, get out of these marriages, and they can also inherit and own property which wasn't always guaranteed in the Arabian Peninsula before Islam. Um, the law doesn't require women oh, excuse me. The law doesn't require women to wear the traditional veils to cover up their entire bodies. That's more of um, a cultural thing than it is a religious one. Now, after the death of Muhammad, there is no clear successor, uh, which is ultimately going to lead to, we talked about this in Christianity, we're also going to see it in Islam, a schism, a split in the churches, and it deals with the leadership positions, uh, who should be in charge. Now, unlike some other religions like Christianity, which are very structured, you don't see the same amount of structure uh, in Islam that you do in Christianity, but it is still very important as far as who should be the religious leader. Okay. Now, the Shiites, or the Shia, uh, believe that only descendants of Fatima, which is um, Muhammad's daughter, or her husband Ali, should succeed Muhammad. Um, and this death really marks the split. Okay, The Shiites are going to 
go in this direction that it should stay within that family. Today, Shiites are the smaller of these two groups as far as population is concerned, and we see most of them, although they are in other countries, but where they are concentrated the most are in the modern day country of Iran, uh, but you also see them in Iraq and Syria and other um, areas as well as Islam spreads. The other group that develops are the Sunnis, in which they believe any follower is eligible, once again going with that idea of equality that is so prevalent in Islamic thought. These two groups are going to struggle for power, and you're going to see the rise of some various dynasties and empires that start to begin to develop in this early, in this early history. During this time frame, you're going to see Islam spread uh, and actually take some land from the Persians. They're going to overrun, or not the Persians, the Byzantines, excuse me. They're going to take parts of Persia. Uh, they're also going to take Palestine, the city of Jerusalem, which they're going to hold for a very long time, for the next 400 years or so plus, and Syria. Uh, by about this time, the Arabian Empire was firmly established as a world power. Now, Islamic conquests are going to continue under these Umayyad caliphs, the four right or righteous caliphs, as we call them. Okay, um, Very important, the Umayyads are actually going to move the capital. It's going to be out of Mecca, and it's actually going to uh, be moved to Damascus, which is in modern-day Syria. Um, this puts them closer to the Mediterranean and ultimately closer in contact with more trade routes and also contact with the Western world as well. They're going to also, during the Umayyad uh, time period, spread into North Africa. They're also going to end up going and conquering most of what is um, Spain, which at that time had been controlled by the Visigoths, uh, this Germanic tribe, and ultimately going to be stopped by a, uh, a Frankish uh, commander, not a king, but a Frankish commander by the name of Charles Martel, who stops them at the Battle of Tours in modern-day western France. This battle is extremely significant because if they're not halted there, uh, the Christian world that encompasses much of western Europe might not exist. Charles Martel is able to stop Abu Bakr. Um, you have then, after the reign of Abu Bakr and this rapid expansion, you have Umar, uh, who is a main military genius that spread out from Arabia, and Uthman ultimately replaces him, and this is when you start to see the empire fall into a civil war. Um, he is ultimately going to be assassinated by followers of Ali, once again leading to this schism, this split, and Ali, who is Muhammad's son-in-law and cousin, uh, many refuse to accept Ali as the leader because of how he gained power. This wasn't a very, you know, righteous thing to do. Uh, so he ends up being killed by an assassin as well. Now these Umayyads, um, they claim the caliphate, which is, if, I'm, if I say caliph or caliphate, we're just referring to almost like a king or a monarch or, 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 or a ruler, okay? Uh, Damascus, Syria, like I said, is the capital. Now, after the Umayyads go into decline and all this disarray that's happening, you have the rise of the Abbasid dynasty. About 754, they seize this area. Al-Mansur uh, ends up building a new capital in modern-day Baghdad, which is now in the country of Iraq, in ancient Mesopotamia. Now, let's talk briefly about the Abbasids. Um, Baghdad ends up becoming a city of immense wealth um, under a later caliph by the name of Al-Rashid. Uh, they become a great center for artwork. They become patrons of the arts, arts, people that are paying to uh, develop these arts and sciences. Uh, Al Rashid is a poet. He's a scholar himself. Um, so he's going to invite them. Um, he's going to make contact with the Western world. There's a great story of, um, we're going to talk about him later in the year, but Charlemagne, the great Frankish king, is going to come in contact with Al Rashid. And Al Rashid is going to give him something that he never saw before as a gift, and he's going to give them elephants. Um, you know, these battle elephants that they would use. Uh, he also opens up the first Muslim hospital. Uh, he builds great structure, the Green Dome Palace in Baghdad, which becomes the new capital. And this fabulous court life during his reign. 
uh, marked by great prosperity. It's also going to inspire the book, 1001 Arabian Nights, sometimes just called Arabian Nights. Uh, where you get stories like Aladdin from. It's also during this time that we do start to see uh, the changing role of women. Um, they sort of have this mixed role within Islamic society as as these civilizations develop, these kingdoms develop. Um, you know, women were, were sort of encouraged to live in seclusion, which is ultimately why you see them always covered and with the veil and out in public. Um, But this is also something that, you know, living in seclusion and everything, it's not always easily afforded by all. Uh, so you do see some women in public, and, and like I said, they can own property as well. I'm going to end this presentation by just taking a look at a map here. Uh, you have, I mean, brief amount of time. Great cities of Mecca and Medina um, spread by Muhammad during his lifetime. And then as they go out, under these first four caliphs of the Umayyad dynasty, um, they're going to spread all the way up into North Africa. They're going to take Egypt, which was up, you know, part of the Byzantine Empire at one point. They're going to stretch into most of what is Persia. If you see here, they're getting into India as well. This is going to be important when we talk about contributions because they're math contributions in the field of algebra. Uh, and then later on, boom, into the Visigothic Kingdom, stopped at the Battle of Tours, and then their expansion is pretty much halted in Europe to Spain at that point. Okay. Uh, if you notice on this map, what you're not going to see, and you really don't see it in large numbers today even, is the spread of Islam into sub-Saharan or south of the Sahara, um, sub-Saharan Africa. They can't cross this. Okay. It's that natural physical barrier, sparse population not really worth it. They're focusing on most of North Africa, which is going to have a lot of um, uh, trade routes. Excuse me. Lost my train of thought there. Alright, that's about it for this one. we got one more presentation to go. See you next time.